This morning, we are very fortunate to have with us Venerable Yu Teng, who will be sharing with us on her topic, The Ten Paths to Happiness. This is based on the Sumati Sutta, and it is very applicable for lay persons. Venerable Yu Teng has a bachelor's degree in business management from Macy University, New Zealand, bachelor's degree in Buddhist studies, Songling University, Taiwan, master's degree in education policy and society, Cardiff University, UK, and is currently pursuing a PhD in educational psychology from the University of Malaya. Venerable Yu Teng is a lecturer in Tong Tongchen Buddhist College and Vice President of Buddha Lights International Association Young Adult Division, Malaysia Chapter. She is also a regular Dharma speaker in Malaysia and Singapore's tertiary institutions. Let us now put our palms together to welcome Venerable Yu Teng for her sharing. What do you, Venerable? Thank you, Brother Ng. Auspicious blessings to everyone. I'm honored to be on this platform to share with you 10 paths to happiness. Happiness is an enormous part of our daily lives and has been studied often. From the newspaper, we knew that the happiest country in the world is Bhutan, right? Because in 1972, the king of this country declared that cross-national happiness is more important than cross-domestic product. The concept implies that sustainable development should take a holistic approach towards notions of progress and give equal importance to non-economic aspects of well-being. Happiness is also explicit in Singapore national pledge. Do you know that? Which end with so as achieve happiness, prosperity and progress for our nation. Indeed, beginning with Singapore's independence in 1965, the nation has given enormous attention to material prosperity and progress. My friends, does happiness come with wealth, prosperity and progress? What do you think? Okay, let us talk about the measurement of happiness. How to measure happiness? A number of scholars have studied and distinctively defined happiness subjectively, proposing that happiness is composed of both effect and connection. Yeah. So materialism has long been cited as a core value in the world and appears to be a well-developed one, like even in Singapore and Malaysia, who residents will um, ray with humor refer to the uh, pursuit of five C's of happiness. What are the five C's? Car, condominium, credit card, club membership, and cash. Yeah, and the cash. So in addition to the materialism scholars examine virtuosity because of its strong reported influence on individuals' emotional experience, thinking, behavior, and psychological well-being. Further, religiosity and materialism are just opposed here because evidence suggests they may be opposite in nature. Excessive materialism has long been criticized as being incompatible with religious fulfillment. And studies have reported negative relationship between materialism and religiosity. So does happiness come with wealth, prosperity, and progress? About this question, let's find out the answer from the Sumati Sutra. Sumati Sutra is part of the larger sutra called Great Treasures Collection Sutra, which describes the Bodhisattva path. This sutra is about an eight-year-old girl named Sumati, 
asked the Buddha 10 endless questions on how to live happily in this life and beyond. With the Buddha's detailed responses revealing that happiness can only be attained when we understand the nature of the world and practice for the benefits of others. At one time, the Buddha was joined by an assembly of 1,250 monastics, as well as 10,000 great Buddhisattva at Virgil Peak. Sumati calmly walked towards to the Buddha, she bowed and circumambulate the Buddha three times, then knelt and joined her palms. He, she asked 10 interesting questions in finding ways to happiness. Now let us take a look at the first question on how one can attain an elegant, proper appearance. In the Sutra, the Buddha said, Sumati, Bodhisattva used four methods to attain arrogant, proper appearance. What are the four? First, do not give rise to anger when dealing with unwholesome friends. Tranquility abide with great loving kindness. Take deep joy in the true Dharma. Make Buddha's images. Okay, first, do not give rise to anger. To many of us, anger is one of the ways to transfer feelings of guilt, fear, and hurt, right? So when things are not going as we plan or as we wish, they might be hatred or agitation in our mind. When we are agitated, we might lose our sense of reasoning, putting aside our morals and losing our sense of humanity. Just like a Buddhist saying, when one thought of anger arises, hundreds of thousands of obstacles are created. So how do we not give rise to anger? The Buddha shared his teaching in Majihima Agama in not giving rise to anger. The Buddha said, if, listen carefully, it's quite complicated, if we are wise, when someone's actions are not kind, but one's words are kind, we should not pay attention to one's unkind actions, but only be attentive to one's kind words. When someone's words are not kind, but his or her actions are kind, then we do not pay attention to that one's words, only be attentive to one's actions. When we see someone whose actions and words are not kind, but where there is still a little kindness in one's heart, do not pay attention to one's actions and words, but to the little kindness that is in one's heart. When we see someone whose words and actions are not kind, and in whose heart there is nothing that can be called kindness, what to do. So we must give rise to this thought. Someone whose words, actions, and heart is nothing can be called kindness is someone who is undergoing great suffering. Unless one meets a good spiritual friend, there will be no chance for one to transform and go to the realm of happiness. Thinking like this, we will be able to open our heart with love and compassion towards that person. We will be able to put an end to our anger and help that person. So we should avoid looking for fault in those who do not treat us well or unkind in action, speech, or mind. We should look at the kindness that one has, whether it's from the actions, words, or mind. If not, we should show kindness to those who do not have. When we have less anger, our appearance will be more gender and dignified. Our lives will be more peaceful and humanist. The second method that Buddha shared is tranquility abide with great loving kindness. My master, Venerable Master Singh, explains that 
loving kindness means bringing sentient beings happiness, whereas great loving kindness means bringing happiness to sentient beings, whether they are relatives or strangers. It is an active method for healing the mind. One example of great loving kindness can be seen in the incident between Buddha and Sariputra. There was a time when Buddha and Sariputra were walking and there were birds in the path. When Buddha walked by, the birds remained calm and unmoved. However, when Sariputra walked closer, the birds flew away when his shadow shaped them. With this, we can tell that every being can feel the Buddha's compassion even with his shadow. Loving kindness and compassion are the foundation of the Buddha's teaching. When we love others like ourselves and distill that into compassion for all sentient beings, it is unconditional great loving kindness and compassion. When our mind is filled with great loving kindness, our appearance will be compassionate, elegant, and dignified. The third method that the Buddha shared in attaining elegant proper appearance is to take deep joy into Dharma. Dharma has several different meanings, my friends. Dharma with small d refer to all phenomena, whereas Dharma with a capital D refers to the truth. It is the teachings of the Buddha. True Dharma refers to those teachings which are right, correct, and do not deviate from the middle way. How can we find true joy in Dharma? What do you think? How? The Dharma that Buddha shared with us allow us to better understand life and to see the improvements when we practice righteousness in our daily living. The Dharma joy arises from when we experience happiness and satisfaction. However, in today's society, many people say they know they should rejoice in the true Dharma, but in reality, they embrace false Dharma in all the times and enjoy listening to false teachings, especially those that emphasize on supernatural power and instant enlightenment. This false teaching might seem tempting to many, but this will lead we or lead us into more greediness and being unclear of the Buddha's teachings. So we should be aware and mindful of what we practice. One of the main practice is the Noble Eightfold Path a code of moral contact we cultivate with the main focus on relieving suffering. When we practice the Dharma at home, at work, at the temple, or wherever we are, our bodily actions, speech, and mind will be of righteous and wholesome. We will experience uh, the difference and improvements. All right? The fourth method shared by the Buddha is to make Buddha images in this very mind. Why should we make Buddha images, my friends? Did the Buddha really want everyone to make images of him and worship his body? This is actually a skillful means for us to remember our teacher, the Buddha, and reminding ourselves of Buddha's nature in us. So what will happen if our mind has the image of the Buddha? When we venerate the Buddha's images, strengthens our faith and help us persevere in our practice. Whenever we are about to get angry and we saw the Buddha's image in front of us, 
we will remind ourselves of the Buddha asking what will the Buddha do in facing a similar situation. Or whenever we have an unwholesome thought or evil thought in our mind, the Buddha images will remind us not to do so. Yeah. So without an image or symbol of venerate, how will people or like us find a worthy figure to model ourselves after? Thus, the Buddha image is a mean by which we can connect with the Buddha, helping us to discover the Buddha nature within ourselves. Then our mind gradually become free illusory thoughts. Admit formlessness, our temperament changes. So after that change, we will gradually develop an elegant, proper appearance as well. Okay, then Sumadhi continue to ask the Buddha second question. How is a life of perfect wealth attained? Buddha replied, first, give timely gifts. Second, give without a contempt or arrogance. Third, give joyfully. Fourth, give with no expectations of reward. Wealth is something that most of us would like to have and it is concerning the success of this life. And yet, many people thought that Buddhists should not pursue wealth and should only be concerned with enlightenment. Is that true, my friends? Well, this sutra discusses both worldly and supramundane wealth and needs. Not only that, we need to have the right understanding that the dukkha arises is not because of wealth, but because of our endless greed and craving to have more. The Buddha guides us in understanding the causes, conditions, and effects in obtaining wealth in this sutra. Most of us find it hard to earn living, and some cannot help out complain about others who are better off with resources and things seem to come easily. Why can't they have these things? They always thought. So where do all these good conditions and effects come from? All the good conditions and rewards don't just come like that nor can be forcibly and taken or through wishful praying. Of course, the Buddha wants us to understand the causes we had created and to embrace the effect. So the questions to ask ourselves, have we seeded the rewards and blessings? If we haven't seeded, what will we harvest? Do we cultivate wholesome affinities and connections with others? If not, how would we expect something out of nothing? Right? So that is a Buddha saying. When one gives, one will receive. Or in other words, what we sow, is what we reap. If we cultivate the wholesome causes of giving and sharing, eventually, when the conditions are ready, one will receive the wholesome effects. Therefore, in the second path to happiness, the Buddha shared with us is this. Give time, timely give. Give. Giving is, most, is the most wonderful action in making affinities with others. And timeliness in giving is crucial in making sure that things or help is being given at the right time. Brandon Master Xin the greatest wealth in the world 
is understanding how to give to others. The greatest poverty is greedily converting that others have. Yeah. So when it comes to giving, one not only give wealth, what else we can give? Other ways of giving are like speaking wholesome words, expressing gratitude, and serving others, or even giving a smile. Yeah. So the Buddhist concept of giving also increased sharing of Dharma and giving fearlessness. We might be familiar with giving wealth, which is to offer physical support to others. However, not many people know the other two types of giving, that is sharing of Dharma and giving fairness. Sharing Dharma is referring to using the knowledge, skill, and the truth to help others. Giving fearlessness is to let others feel safe with righteous and um, the good acts and eliminating cruelty and ensuring peace in society or offering spiritual comfort to all sentient beings. Yeah. So taking a look at a timely list in giving and sharing, it sets our compassion in action. Yeah. So Buddha taught us to care for the now. Once we set our intention, we should put our plans into action. We will be more mindful and observant of everyone around us. When we see someone being scold, take the initiative, comfort, and encourage one promptly, for example. Yeah. So how do we give? Buddha shared with us, when we give, we should give without contempt or arrogance. Giving joyfully and giving with no expectation of reward. Sometimes it is easy to give, but to do so without any attachment to I might not be that easy. So we need to remember how we give. Yeah. Um, I also heard from my master say, generosity is not about how much is given, but instead on the sincerity of the intention. When we give, we should not obsess over matters such as having versus lacking, rich versus poor, or superior versus inferior. When we receive, we should be grateful and appreciative. Just like the story uh, that I heard uh, before, there is a lady named Mira who was homeless and begged for living. One day, Mira went begging for food. As she walked past the temple, a Dharma service was ongoing. She saw many people making all kinds of offering and inspire her to offer too. However, she felt disappointed as she did not have anything to offer as she was a beggar. So while she was feeling that, she put her hands in her pocket. To her surprise, she found something. What is that? A penny. Happily, she walked into the temple, standing in front of the Buddha statue. She knelt and prayed. When she was finished, she took out her only penny and dropped it into the donation box. As Mira was leaving the shrine, the monk stopped her and said, Excuse me, could you please wait? Our abbot would like to meet you. To Mira's surprise, the abbot pray for her and her family personally. Equally touched and bothered, Mira said to the abbot, thank you so much. You didn't have to do all that for me. I'm just a beggar 
with nothing. The abbot, with pride, you gave everything you had. I see before me a sincere person with a good heart. Mila left the temple, feeling grateful and fulfilled. From that day on, though she continued to be a beggar, she felt different, more at peace with herself. A few months later, the whole nation was in mourning as the queen had passed away. The king was inconsolable and the royal minister suggested an outing to ease his sadness. When they were in the forest, from afar they saw a beam of light shining on a tree. As they go, they go closer, they discovered that the light shone on Mira, who was sitting in meditation. Despite her wreck appearance, Beauty flow from her. When the king heard about Mira, he decided to bring her back to the palace. Feeling very grateful, Mila would spend her time comforting the king with stories. As the months passed, the king fell in love with her and decided to marry her and crown her as the queen. After becoming the queen, Mila was reflecting on her life's journey. She suddenly remembered her offering to the temple. The next day, she proposed to the king that she would go make an offering to the temple. She took 10 wagons of offerings to the temple. She was waiting for the abbot to come and pray for her, but to her surprise as well. She was greeted by a monk. So she was irritated. Then the humble monk said, I am very sorry, your majesty. Our abbot would like me to send this message to you. <clears throat> In the past, you were a beggar. A penny was all you had. You offer it with great sincerity. That kind of offering is worth more than anything. However, today, even though you came with 10 regans of offerings, you have also brought along your arrogance. Okay, to have perfect wealth, let us give and share with others promptly and without arrogance. Yeah, so this is a story shared by my master as well. Okay. On the third path of happiness in maintaining harmony in the family, the Buddha said, Sumadhi, Buddhisattva use four methods to keep their families from destruction. They are skillfully abandon diverse, uh, di uh, diversive language. And second, persuade sentient beings by the wrong view uh, and abide to the right view. Third, protect and ensure the continuation of the true Dharma. Fourth, teach all sentient beings to attain Buddhahood. Family is built on respect, trust, and love, my friends. Right? So people closest to us in this world are our family members. Family members are always our support and often a heaven to talk about our successes, setbacks, gains, and losses. The wider concept of family is not limited to people with blood relationship, but can be extended well into the community or in the world. Yeah. However, we all have differences and personalities even we are in one family, right? How do we maintain connected and harmony? We should skillfully abandon divisive language. What is divisive language? They are words that are said in two-faced, 
and judgment away. Sometimes we might come across people who try to instigate conflicts between groups or friends, spreading rumors on both sides. So we should avoid doing so at all costs. My friend, if we can't control our mouth, how would we be able to control our mind? There are five conditions to contemplate before speaking. First, you must think, do I speak at the right time or not? Second, do I speak of facts or not? Third, do I speak genderly or harshly? And do I speak beneficial words or not? Lastly, do I speak with a kind heart or inwardly malicious? So when we can contemplate the above, we think of above, our words are not only true, comforting, are also carefully said and with wisdom. Then harmony in families will not be impossible, right? Another method in maintaining harmony is to have the right view. Uh, with the right view, we can see the world correctly and have a proper understanding of causes and conditions in all matters in life. We will see the cause and effect of everything that comes together and fall apart. Without the right view, people will lack reasoning, correct? And one often blame others whenever they are obstacles in life, they often confuse right and wrong and arrogantly believe they are right. They are always right. right. So if everyone in a family can engage in the right thoughts, having the right belief and get along with all other family members and friends, then that household will be in harmony. The, so the society will be without conflict and the world will be at peace, right? So don't you think that having the right view and true dharma is crucial? Yeah, so this is very important. And many of us exclaim that we have not had an opportunity to be born when Buddha was around and learn from the Buddha personally. However, we know that there are infinite Buddhas in the different Buddha's realms. How should we cultivate to be born there? The Buddha said, first offer flowers, fruits, and powder, incense at Tathagata stupas and temples. Second, never bring harm upon others. Third, make Tathagata images or the Buddha images and place them upon Lotus throne. Fourth, develop a pure faith in the enlightenment of all Buddhas. First of all, one of the common questions that people ask is, why do Buddhists offer flowers, fruits, and incense? to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas at the temple. Yeah. So what is the significance of this offering? When the Buddha was still around, people could make offering to the Buddha directly. After Buddha Parivivana, what can we do? We would visit Buddhist temples to do offering to the Triple Gem. It shows our respect to our teacher, the Buddha, right? And our devote faith in the teachings. It is also a skillful practice for us in the perfections of giving. Never bring harms upon others. Um, what is the practice in offering loving kindness and compassion to others? Just now, we have learned the basic practice of loving kindness and compassion. However, at times, it might not be that easy to practice loving kindness and compassion, especially when it comes to people we have less affinity with. Or in other words, the 
people that we don't like. Yeah? Okay. Um, but another way which has similar effect is when we remind ourselves to at least not harm others. Yeah, if we, you cannot practice to the person you do not like, but at least not harm these people if you do not like them, right? It is through respect and upholding precepts that we can avoid harming others if you want to do so. Yeah. So when we uphold precepts, we make good affinities with others. Our faith in the Buddha's teaching grows stronger and we will be more virtuous. So we will be more aware of our three karmas. What is that? Body, speech, and thought. Yeah. So with the precepts, we can, we, we, we can uh, attune ourselves to others such that we live in harmony in, with a group. Eventually, eventually, we will cultivate more wisdom and less afflictions. It is just like during the Buddha's time when the Sangha was first established. The Buddha did not lay down any precepts. When the Sangha grew bigger, and there was a need to have precepts to ensure the harmony of the community. Precepts help the preservation of Buddha teaching. Without precepts, it will be impossible to have the Sangha. Without the Sangha, there will not be the Dharma. Yeah. So precepts act like a discipline master within our mind. Thus, there is a Buddhist saying, where precepts abide, the Sangha abides. Where the Sangha abides, the Dharma abides. In the Mahaparivana Sutra, the Buddha said, the Dharma and precepts will be your teacher after my passing. With the guidance of the Buddha's teachings and precepts, we are in this path in discovering our Buddha's nature. Have deep faith in the Dharma and it will just be like in the presence of the Buddha. After learning the methods of cultivating the merits to be, uh, to be born in the presence of the Buddha, how can we travel from one Buddha land and to another? Yeah. Once again, Buddha says, Sumati, Buddhisafa use four methods to travel from one Buddha land to another. They are, first, do not hinder or become angry at the sight of others cultivating wholesomeness. Second, do not hinder others from speaking the Dharma. Third, light lamp offering at the Buddha statue. Fourth, continuously cultivate all varieties of meditative concentration. So one of the methods suggested by the Buddha in traveling freely to the Buddha land is creating positive causes and conditions for others. When we see others perform good deeds, we should be joyful and praise their efforts. We should not be jealous of others' success, nor hindering others from succeeding. Sometimes it is not easy because our poor habit of not acknowledging the merits of others and hoping the worst before them. Fair or not. So this is our habit. Um, it is just like the Devadatta, yeah, the Buddha's cousin. When he started his journey in practicing as a monk, his mind was clear and pure. However, when he encountered fame and the desire to lead the Sangha himself, his path was sidetracked. Eventually, his mind was blinded by greed and hatred. He was jealous on how everyone takes refuge under the Buddha. Devadatta tried unwholesome ways to criticize and harm the Buddha. Nevertheless, the Buddha was being very compassionate and never gave up on him, giving him positive causes and conditions. 
in Buddhism, there is a saying here. If we cannot stand to see others benefit, how can we claim to wish for their Buddhahood? So we should keep the practice of encouraging, praising, and appreciating others to reverse the habits of jealousy. It is just like in the Buddha land. Whenever a Buddha is being born, all Buddhas joyfully support the birth of that Buddha. When we all practice in this way, everyone will be closer and closer to the Buddha's land in this world. Another method that Buddhas recommended is not to uh, impede or hinder others from speaking the Dharma. We should not be in a way of others or obstructing one from sharing the Buddha's teachings. There was one occasion when the ascetics were trying to hinder the Buddhas from speaking the Dharma when the Buddha and his disciples were at Sarawasti. Many people went regularly to listen to the teachings and to offer the Sangha. However, not all the people of Sarawasti were the followers of the Buddha. There were many ascetics in the area who believed that their teachings were superior and they were very jealous when they saw more and more people going to the Buddha. Soon, overcome by jealousy, they decided to do something about it. They told Sundari, a female wandering ascetic, about this and asked for her help to check on Sangha regularly. Yeah. So Sundari does, did, did not know the real purpose or intention of the ascetic. So after some time, the ascetic was certain that many people had seen Suntari going regularly to the Jetta's group where Buddha's living. Okay. They kill her and bury her in a nearby drain. Then they went to the king and reported that Suntari was missing and was last seen with the Buddha. The king said, then you must go immediately to search for her over there. The ascetics pretended to search for Sun, uh, Sundari and they went to the spot where they had buried her. They dug up her body and placed the corpse on a stretcher. They then carry it back to the Sravasti. Along the way, they shouted angrily at the top of their voices. See, the work of this monk who called themselves holy people. They are shameless and wicked liars. See what they have done. They have committed sexual misconduct with poor Sundari, and then they have killed her to hide their crimes. Buddha's disciple became frightened by these accusations and did not know what to do. The Buddha remained calm. Within seven days, the shouting and accusation will subside. After some time, the king discovered that the very ascetic who had warned of the evil deeds had committed the crime. When they were brought before the king, they confessed their crimes in the public and were punished accordingly. Reflecting on this story, even though the ascetics were trying to hinder the Buddha from speaking the Dharma in Sravasti, the true Dharma will always stand. Lastly, to be born in the presence of a Buddha, we should offer our sincerity 
and respect to the Buddha so that we develop a pure faith in the enlightenment of all Buddhas and never bring harms to others. To travel freely, we must create positive causes and conditions for others and not impede or hinder others from speaking the Dharma. So with sufficient wholesome merit and a mind without distortion, we will be able to travel there. So looking at the sixth path to happiness, Sumata asked the question of how to live blamelessly when interacting with others. The Buddha suggested four methods. First, make good Dharma friends without fretting. Second, do not be jealous of others' accomplishment. Third, when others achieve fame, be happy for them. Fourth, while cultivating Bodhisattva practices, do not slight or slander others. Okay, let us take a closer look at the two of the four suggested methods here. Let us look in this to make good Dharma friends without fraternity. In this competitive world, uh, there are many times people are fighting for power or comparing social status with each other, right? So people might utilize different ways of winning and getting what they want. So one of the unwholesome ways is fraternity fatally and uh, it is one of the 10 unwholesome deeds, as we know. How would we know one is good Dharma friends and that we can get along without fraternity? In the book of Living Affinity, Venerable Master Sing Yun shared with us four types of friends. Yeah. First type of friends who treat us like a flower. They will be delighted as long as their friends can fulfill certain needs of theirs. But when their friends out, outlive their usefulness, they toast them out like with a flower. So this is a type of friends like treat us like a flower. The second type is the friend who act like a scale. It is a kind of judging and comparing friendship. The third type is the friends who are like the mountains and friends with full treasures and wonders. With these friends, we are constantly reminded of the beauty and diversity of life. The fourth type is the friends who are like the earth that let everything grow is on its rich soil. Yeah. So such friends can help us grow in our wisdom and strengthen our character. Thus, we should make friends the earth. A good Dharma friends will guide us through our difficult times and overcome it together. On the other hand, when it comes to friends that treat us like a flower, or a scale, some might be skilled fatterers as they might speak presently, but what they say is untrue and unfaithful, right? So you might ask, how can we identify when one is fatterling? What is fatterling? In the Sika Rovata Sutra, Sika Rovata Sutra, the, it stated that the federal can be identified by four things. By supporting both bad and good behavior indiscriminately, praising you to your face and putting you down behind your back. One saying, what must be said and do what must be done. Do not fretter too sick to curry favor with those in power. 
when we praise others, we praise the truth of others, not making something up to make others feel good. Yeah. So this is what um, Venerable Master Sing Yun promotes on the three acts of goodness. Three acts of goodness is do good deeds, speak good words, and have good thoughts. Yeah. So speak good words is very important. So living with utmost ease and happiness and with maximum ability to benefit others depends on our ability and willingness to approach all relations with compassion, pure heart, and the proper frame of mind. When it comes to friendship, it should be based on mutual affinity, not one-sided effort. Real friendships are an actual and resounding expressions of true joy. Then our affinity with others will be wholesome and without fraternity. Okay. In this Saha world, um, we live in, yeah, this Saha world that we live in, people might be unhappy when they see others do good or excel in life. When we are uh, righteous, others might criticize or slander us. We all know that slandering and bullying others diminish others' hidden virtue. So, but many people criticize the right thing we do or say as part of our Buddhist Sava practice, we learn to be patient. Yeah. So Contemplating on what the Buddha said on being patient in the 42 Section Sutra, it states that for the wicked to harm the virtuous would be like raising one's head, yeah, spitting at the sky. The spitter does not reach the sky but fall back upon oneself. So, or it is like throwing dust against the wind, against the wind. Yeah. So the dust does not go someplace else, but collect upon oneself instead. Yeah. So why would we want to argue with ignorant people? Treat it as an opportunity to reflect and to master our practice in being patient and tolerant so we will live blamelessly. And next, as we continue our search in the seven path to happiness, how would we be trustworthy? Trustworthy is being able um, to be rely on or provide what is needed or right. Trustworthiness is a person's second life, so to speak. Yeah. If a person is dishonest, his credibility will be undermined and obstacles will arise everywhere. That's the saying, breaking someone's trust is like crumbling up a perfect piece of paper. You can open it and smooth it over, but it is never going to be the same as the new paper again. Yeah. So the Buddha's advice, Sumati, there are four methods to ensure that people trust their every word. First, always be consistent in your words and practice. Second, do not hide your wrongdoing from good Dharma friends. Third, do not seek fault in the Dharma one hears. Fourth, do not give rise to unwholesome thought towards those who speak the Dharma. Let's us uh, as promo in the method on always be consistent in our words and practice and do not seek fault in the Dharma we hear. In life, a person can be without money 
or status, but not credibility or trust. Why? If one were to lose one credibility, even money cannot buy it back. Trustworthiness is the virtue that upholds morality, maintaining the trust of others and gaining others' respect. So we should always be consistent in our words and practice. In Setaka Sutra, the Buddha shared a story about an acrobat and his apprentice. The acrobat said to his apprentice, yeah, I pro uh, you protect me and I will protect you. We get down safely. It sounds uh, logic and right, correct, right? However, his apprentice replied, Sir, you protect yourself and I will protect myself. So each self-guarded and self-protected and we will get down safely. So by protecting oneself, one protects each other is the cultivation of mindfulness. Whereas by practicing patience, harmlessness, loving kindness, and sympathy, protecting others, one protects oneself. When we are mindful and always being consistent in our words and practice, it is just like protecting ourselves. When we are being trustworthy to others, we are protecting others and not lying to others. Do not seek forth in the Dharma one hears. For us to be able to live healthy, we cherish it. For us to be able to listen and learn the Dharma, it is an opportunity that is hard to encounter. Um, there is a Buddhist saying, it is rare to hear the Buddha's teachings and rare to meet an excellent teacher. It is rare to attain a human body and rare to have all sense organs. The Buddha is no longer around to teach us the Dharma personally. We rely on the Dharma teacher to share the teachings. So when we listen to a good Dharma teacher or friend in expounding the Dharma, be an empty clean cup to fill with the Dharma water. We should not seek thought in the Dharma we hear. If our mind is filled with conceit, there will be no room for words of wisdom. If we already have presumption in our mind, even the best truth cannot enter. It is just like adding clean water into a dirty vessel. So next, the eighth question that Sumadhi asked, how can one eliminate obstructions to practice the Dharma? The replied, first, embrace the three categories of Buddhist Safa precepts. Second, after hearing the profile sutras, do not slander them. Third, see those who make their initial intention then give rise to the mind of all wisdom. Fourth, treat all sentient beings with great loving kindness and equanimity. Embrace the three categories of Bodhisattva precepts. Uh, like, mm, as we know, the main purpose of upholding precepts is not to harm others, right? So when it comes to Bodhisattva precepts, it is an even more proactive ways of cultivation that is to benefit sentient beings. What are the Bodhisattva precepts for lay people? The Bodhisattva precepts comprise of precepts of proper conduct, precepts of wholesome deeds, and precepts of benefiting sentient beings. This is aligned with what 
the words of the seven ancient Buddhas saying, do nothing that is unwholesome, do all that is wholesome. Purify the mind, this is the teaching of all Buddhas. When we parallel the Bodhisattva precepts with the three vows, they will be as follows. Precept of proper conduct is I vow to do no evil. Precepts of wholesome deeds is I vow to do wholesome deeds. Precepts of benefiting sentient beings, which is I vow to liberate all sentient beings. So in the teachings uh, bequeathed by the Buddha Sutra, the Buddha explained, precepts are the foundation of liberation. He used precepts to tame the unruly minds of us. And from there, we learn how to uphold the precepts as a way to discipline ourselves. Most importantly, we understand the intention behind all precepts. The precepts of not harming others are not just for those who uphold them in a formal Buddhist ceremony, but apply to everyone. Okay, for example, killing. When a person kills or harms someone, one will be behind the bars already, right? However, precepts and regulations are not entirely the same. Precepts come from within by self-discipline, whereas regulations are regulated by someone or other outside entity. Yeah. So when we see those who make their initial intention, yeah, then give rise to the mind of all wisdom. What is this? Mean? Initial vow and intention are crucial. Okay, it is, it is just like our uh, compass in our practice, continuously aspiring to move forward in the journey and discovering and seeing the truth of life, it prevents us from regressing, have a goal and motivation. When we first made our initial intention, some of us vow to take refuge in the Triba Gem to be the disciple of the Buddha. Some vow to uphold the precepts of a monastic and be at service to others throughout our life like us. It is easy to set an initial intention, but it might be challenging to uphold it permanently or in lifelong. Correct. It's very difficult. Um, there is an uh, incident where a devotee who wanted okay, to return or cancel her refuge to the triple gem okay, uh, in a temple. Why would she want to do so? Okay. It, is, it was because of a senior volunteer who was a little tough on her in making sure all the details of the altar were in place. The variable asked this devotee, okay, uh, why would you want to uh, cancel or return the refuse? So this is her answer. And the vulnerable asks again, okay, when you took refuge in the triple gem, who did you take refuge in? The volunteer or the devotee replied, well, I take refuge in the Buddha, in the Dharma, and in the Sangha. Oh, in this case, the venerable replied, I cannot accept your return in your refuge. And the devotee asked, why? The venerable said, it is because you have taken refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, not to the senior volunteer. After hearing this, the devotee had an aha moment. 
So he or she continued her journey as a practicing Buddhist until today. So she remained and still staying in the temple, serve as a volunteer. Thus, when we make our initial intention, the route um, ahead might be pumpy. However, the initial intention is the most powerful energy. That is, when we hold strong and have the right understanding of our initial aspiration, we will always remember the original reason and the intention of having it in the first place. When we practice the Bodhisattva path, no matter what we encounter, to embrace everything with kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity, giving rise to the mind of all wisdom, then the Dharma obstructions along the way will be removed one by one. Next, on the ninth path of happiness, Sumati asked the question on how to avoid Mara. It seems to be a follow-up question after learning about Dharma obstructions. What should we do when we encounter the Mara within ourselves? First of all, uh, let me ask, what is Mara? Mara are the obstacles to cultivation, right? They originate from within our minds, such as greed, anger, and jealousy which incite in the afflictions of ignorance. Maras can be categorized into two, yeah? internal maras and external maras. The internal maras are the three poisons, greed, hatred, and ignorance. Yeah, these are three poisons, greed, hatred, and ignorance also known as the Mara of Afflictions. There is also Maras from our physical form, feeling, perception, mental formation, or thought, and consciousness. It's also known as the Mara of Aggregates. As for external Maras, it could be anything external that distract us from uh, our practice, for example, social media, mobile phone, or anything presence that might divert our focus. So everything that causes us to regress, damage our dignity, violate the spirit of Buddhism, or deviate from the path can be considered maras. However, whether it is external or internal maras, everything comes from our defiled mind, a mind with great hatred and ignorance. Yeah. So take an example. When we try to do something, we search on website. Okay, we want to search something or we want to watch the news. Sometimes we might get distracted by the pop-up advertisement on the site. Okay. We might end up browsing other sites that are not related to what we want to research on, yeah, which is Mala here. The advertisement or our mind that got attracted by what we saw. Yeah. So when we want to review our to-do list on our mobile phone, we might receive notification from the apps on our phone. We could be replying to the messages, watching the short video clips, and we might lose ourselves in the social media world huh? again, which is the Mara. Yeah. So now let us um, time travel back to 2,600 years ago, reviewing the life of the Buddha before enlightenment. According to the text, Mara approached him with images of fear and temptation. However, Buddha remained unmoved and subjugated the Mara. How did Buddha do it? The Buddha shared with Sumadhi, okay, the, there are four methods. First, completely understand that Dharma nature is equal. Second, 
give rise to delusions. Third, constantly contemplate the Buddha. Fourth, dedicate the marriage from all wholesome roots. So we will discuss the first two methods completely, understand the Dharma nature is equal and give rise to diligence. Okay. In the book titled on Buddhist democracy, freedom and equality, Venerable Master Singh commented that the Buddha does not position himself above sentient beings. He sees himself as an enlightened sentient beings and sentient beings like us as an enlightened Buddhas. Yeah. So Buddha is an enlightened sentient beings and sentient beings are the Buddha to be. So there is no difference between one's intrinsic nature and the Buddha's mind. Okay. All beings, including us, exist as part of the Dharma in this Dharma realm. The Buddha said, the Dharma nature is equal. There is no distinction between each other. We, if we can completely understand that all Dharma nature is equal, we will not discriminate between the differences as there are no real distinctions. Once our mind can practice equanimity, inequality ceases to exist. When our mind embraces equanimity, not only we will improve, but everything in this world improves. Then Mara will not be close to us. Okay, another common Mara that we encounter is laziness or sloth. Yeah. One of the best medicine recommended by the Buddha is the right diligence or right effort. In the commentary, the word diligence in Chinese comprises of two characters of jing jing. The first character is defined as remain pure and undistracted. And the second character is defined as constantly strive without regressing. Together, it has the connotation of moving forward, bravely bearing burdens, being focused, never giving up, and expanding and distilling one's best quality. In our practice, it requires continuous diligence for us to remove unwholesome behavior, to cultivate unwholesome behavior, to gain happiness, and to liberate ourselves from dukkha. We need to practice right diligence to wake away the Mara of extreme. If we are too hasty, we will face setbacks. If we are too lax, laziness will also lead to regression. The Buddha reminds us in the Sutra on the Buddha's uh, big great te teachings, he said, do not let laziness waste our whole life. Without diligence, we will be washed away with the current and be friends with the Mara. Okay. Constantly contemplate the Buddha is the act of recollecting the Subline quality of the Buddha or reacting the Buddha's name can lead to mental tranquility and abiding joy. When a person's mind is experiencing tranquility and joy, there is definitely no place for Mara, right? Dedicating of merits to all sentient beings is the primary and the most important aspect, recognizing that our practice is beneficial to oneself and others. On the other hand, should we did nothing good, we can repent and determine to improve our cultivation. This is the form of practicing loving kindness as well. Okay, last, the last question, the Sumati asked the Buddha, okay, 
how to ensure that we will be greeted by the Buddhas at the end of our life. Buddha said, we must give gifts to satisfy the needs of others. Second, produce a deep faith in all wholesome teaching. Third, offer all Bodhisattva their ornaments. Fourth, diligently make offering to the triple gem. Okay, in, the, in this life, no matter how we live, uh, we are very fortunate to be born as human. Having the concern, the ability to learn and constantly improving ourselves. We are very fortunate. From the moment we took our first breath, growing up, experiencing under the weather moment to our last breath, we accumulate experiences and cultivate different causes and conditions in life. So with faith, we are conscious of our actions, speech, and thought. We strive to plant the wholesome causes and conditions. When we practice righteously, we make positive affinities with others and generate more merits. Correct? So when the moment comes to us to move on, we always hope that we can continue our journey to pursue our practice with the Buddha until perfection. We have to start our practice now for us to come to that day. It is just like saving money in our bank to have sufficient funds to immigrate to or, or move to another better place. So thus, this is the path to happiness. Let us learn more about the suggested method by the Buddha. Okay. Give, give, uh, give gifts that satisfy the needs of others. So giving is one of the practice that even the Buddha continuously practice until even after enlightenment. Thus, it takes time for us to make it as a habit and overcome the greed in our mind. With this mind, we know that perfection is in giving is not easy, but it is possible. Yeah, for example, um, uh, when Buddha, uh, the Venerable Master Xin Yun, uh, uh, his way of fulfilling one's need is being flexible and going along with the condition. Yeah, so this is his way. There is a Buddha saying, remain flexible yet unchanging, remain unchanging yet flexible. Yeah. So when people go along with condition and let go of worries, happiness will always follow. Yeah. So it's also saying that happiness is an especially wonderful gift to give to others. Happiness is something that grows when it is shared with others. Have a deep faith in all wholesome teaching. Um, the Buddha's teaching are not created or invented. Right? Correct? So he discovered. The teaching are the realization of the rarity of life. Understanding the teaching is like seeing the true form of the world. When Buddha realized the truth on dependent origination, he has an insight on all existence comes to be changing or cease to be with the constant thrust in the causes conditions. So when we comprehend this rarity, we try our best to put together the right causes and condition to have something to work as plan. Of course, there are still many causes and conditions that are not within our control. Yet we can work on the ones that we can manage. Yeah. So we pray, we remind ourselves the Buddha is giving us confidence in our practice. When we pray, we are chanting or reading the Buddha's teachings or sutra, which helps to deepen our daily understanding and contemplation. Yeah. With these reminders of Buddha practices, we constantly try to improve ourselves to be more understanding, to be kind, improve our people's skill in forming positive connection with others. We practice empathy, 
to be clear in mind and to be compassionate to others as well as ourselves. Okay, over to all Bodhisattvas, their ornaments. Let us start with um, uh, in, 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 in short. Okay, um, when we cultivate uh, patience, of living, assisting. It allowed us to endure the hardship, pressure, hunger, thirst, and suffering, and others, non-ideal experience in life, right? That is the saying, a moment of patience in a moment of anger save you a hundred moments of regret. Practicing patience is not suppressing our emotion. Being patient is to recognize the cause and condition, wholesome and unwholesome advantages and disadvantages. Yeah. So the professions of patience is an ornament. Yeah. So it's stated in the great actions and vows of Samantha Brata's chapter. Yeah. Patience is also an ornament that can beautify our life. Okay, diligent makes offering to the triple gem. Yeah. This is the last method. Yeah. So um, when we offering to refer to the triple gem, this, they are Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, right? So offering to the Buddha is to show our respect as, and as a token of appreciation for the teaching the Buddha shared. Offering the Dharma to offering to the Dharma is to support the sharing and continuous teaching in this world. Offering to the Sangha are supporting the monastics who promote the truth, serving the society in spreading compassion and wisdom. Most importantly, by offering to the Triba Gem, we dedicate all wholesome roots to all sentient beings as we cultivate merit in cultivating positive connections with them. As we continuously deepen our affinity with the Triba Gem, we slowly nurture the Buddhist seed in our mind. Gradually, the Buddhist seed germinate and cultivate more wholesome deeds, life after life. This will eventually lead us to realizing the supreme enlightenment with all sentient beings. Okay, to conclude this session, happiness is what we are all seeking for, right? The 10th part of happiness of the Sumati Sutra show us the, the Buddha self-experience and proven methods to the long-lasting happiness, which is liberating ourselves from dukkha and the circle of birth and death. All right. So uh, now, before we end our session, we open up for the Q and A session. <clears throat> Thank you, Venerable, for your very most enlightening talk on the uh, Buddhism, and I, I find. Actually, a lot of parallels, exactly the same as what we teach in Theravada Buddhism. So, uh, thank you. Thank you for the affirmation. There's uh, two questions so far. One is from Tigris Lupus. Venerable, on your slide, how does one attain elegant, proper appearance? You mentioned make Buddha's image. Is this a later teaching that was added since the Buddha never encouraged erecting images in his I image during his time uh, thanks for the question um, as i say actually buddha never wants us to worship him and to make his uh, statue everywhere but this is the need from us as a human being because we want someone who can be our role model to remind us and who actually 
uh, can teach us the truth of this universe and liberate from this Dugga world. And this teaching yeah, is already stated in the Sutra, that is the Dharma. With the Buddha statue, we can remind us, oh, okay, just imagine Buddha in front of us and uh, how dignified the look or appearance of the Buddha. Yeah, we should learn from him. Okay, when we see Buddha's appearance or the Buddha statue, this can help us to calm down. So this can serve as a skillful means or an object for us to um, remember Buddha's, remember the Dharma, and also remember the Sangha. Buddha was a monastic or was a monk during the Buddha's time, right? Yeah. So this reminds us the Three Bajam as well. Yeah. This is not for, for like, like, like the idol to, 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 to admire, but that is a model of a good teacher and who can liberate us from the uh, samsara world. Thank you. Next question from Big Olin. When talking about happiness, should we separate between worldly happiness and spiritual happiness? Um, as I uh, mentioned earlier, the, we should not separate because, because we practice the Dharma and we want to attain enlightenment in this world. So in the very uh, first slide or the second slide that I show how to um, how how to how to measure how to measure the happiness. So that actually happiness is the combination of both. Yeah, both the cognitive and also uh, with, with, which is the materialism and also the religiosity. Yeah. It seems like they are opposite, but we as a human beings, we cannot separate them in our daily life. Okay, for example, wealth. Without money, we cannot, uh, we cannot feel secure in this, in, in this world, right? But how much is enough for you? It's very subjective. We need money, of course, in this world. Yeah. Or let's say now no longer say it's money, but maybe in a, a digital form or not in the notes, but in like everything goes online. You know, we can't see the objects like the monies or the notes, but it consider a, a mood of transaction uh, yeah, in the daily life. If we need something, okay, we pay yeah, or we, we also serve and work yeah, and have this, uh, get the salary in return. Okay. So how much is enough? is enough for you, it's very subjective. If you follow, if we follow the Buddha's teaching, okay, we understand what is great, desire, wholesome and unwholesome. Yeah. So you will know okay, what is the right way to obtain or to get, uh, to earn the wealth. At the same time, without harming or hinder others people. So with the Buddha's teaching and especially the precepts, the precepts is the best guidance on how to pursue wealth in this Monday world okay, with the Dharma. So that is no a uh, very clear cut-off line to separate these two happiness. 
All right. So the definition of happiness yeah, is depends on you how to define it. Thank you. Next question from A.O. Chan. Regarding thinking of past failures, regrets that we've done before, how to repent over this? Okay. Um, there are a few ways to do the repentance. Uh, first of all, the easiest way is to um, join or participate in some uh, Dharma service, which uh, the ritual is specially for the repentance. Yeah, for repentance. And follow the ritual and the ceremony. The, 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 the process will lead us to the situation and the environment and the atmosphere that let us uh, discover and reveal okay, our uh, regrets, our wrongdoings in front of the Buddha statue. Yeah. And also we vow not to repeat again. However, it's always easy say than do, right? So this repentance we need to do, uh, we need to practice, the so-called not do, but we need to practice oftenly because our wrongdoing or our regrets not only one or two. Yeah, we have many. So whenever we, we, we repent okay, in the ceremony, this will remind us not to commit the same misconduct, not to repeat the wrongdoing. Yeah. So this is the first method. And the second method is to transfer the merits every day, every day, yeah, transfer the merits. Transfer of marriage can remind us, oh, okay, today did I do anything good for uh, my family members or for my friends? Yeah. And did I harm anyone today? Yeah. End of the day, we transfer the marriage. This will remind us. Or if I did wrong, okay, please. Uh, forgive me, yeah. and I will not repeat, and I will not do it again. Another another method you can uh, you 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 can do the contemplation, meditation. Okay, we come down. You sit sit down. Okay, you must settle out your own emotion first. You feel regret. You feel very sad, very regretful. However, you must reconcile yourself first. You must settle your emotion first. Okay. So you come to yourself, okay, very sad, uh, heart ache. Okay, very sad, very sad. Let the emotion go. After that, you imagine, okay, you imagine uh, the person that you want to repent in front of you. Yeah. And then you talk to her, for example. Um, lately, there are many cases, um, they, uh, many people die because of COVID-19. And according to the SOP, the family member cannot visit uh, the, the person if uh, uh, admitted in the hospital, right? Yeah, let's say our elders. Yeah, we cannot be at, at their bedside. And also we cannot talk to them or we can't even see them in very last moments of their life. So they, the hospital will 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 proceed with uh, will will handle the crop according to their SOP. So many many people uh, share with us that 
vulnerable, I feel very sad and very regretful. I can't even have a last uh, sight of my elders or my parents. I feel really sad. So uh, usually I will ask them to do like this because they feel sorry. Maybe in uh, during the these parents or the elders uh, when they are still alive, they uh, something that they did wrong and uh, not good enough to these elders. They feel regret until the very last moment of his life. They can't. Uh, seek for the forgiveness from the elders. So first of all, you calm down. If you're very sad, let go. Yeah, re re relieve your emotion. After that, imagine your elders um, in front of you and talk to her and say sorry, apologize. You know, maybe you can say um, one of the incidents. Okay, that day I speak harshly and uh, I did something wrong to you. I'm very sorry. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. And then you can imagine the elders stand in front of you and give you a smiling face and note his or her head. Yeah. Means he already forgive you. Then you talk to him or her again. I vow and I promise you, I will not do this again to other people in the similar situation. Right. So you can practice this many times because perhaps it can be cured in one practice. Yeah, we can do this yeah, every day. You know, or whenever uh, when you when you feel convenience, yeah, you will release the burden, yeah, gradually when times come. So these methods you can try, yeah, or you just focus in chanting or doing the charity in the name or donate in the name of uh, this person. So transfer marriage to this person. So the power of compassion will help you yeah, to repent from the wrongdoing. This is uh, some methods for you to uh, refer. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Venerable, for giving so many skillful means to repent. Another question from Jason Lowe, Venerable. When one is happily enjoying his belongings, he sees no urgency to learn the Dhamma. What can we do to inspire them? Oh, you're right. You're right. Thanks for the uh, question, Jason. Um, we, we always say that it is very hard and difficult to cultivate when we are we, we live in heaven. Yeah. Because the life is too good, and there's no suffering and we our desire all can be fulfilled and we, we don't need to worry and we don't need to uh, uh, um, we, we don't need to strive for our survival yeah so everything is very good why should i uh, cultivate if we want to um if you want to encourage these people, uh, you can show, act as a good model. Yeah, yeah. Show as a good example as a Buddhist. The joy that you can obtain from the Dharma, or from your voluntary work, or from uh, any form of practicing and cultivation. So from you, you can influence the people around us. Start from us, start from yourself first. Because if, 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 if ourselves never buy in the idea of, oh, now we need to cultivate. Yeah. Cultivation and practice or learning Dharma is crucial. Yeah. 
you you can't convince others people yeah you know, always start from us right and also when we think when we think this person actually uh need the dharma okay to help him or her to have a better life okay? this is your thought because this person might not think so they think okay i don't need that i'm good and i'm happy what i i'm having now All right so we can't force because they we can't change other people mind we can't change what you can do just share with this person more often of your happiness your dharma joy and show as a good example you walk the talk yeah i think this is the best way to influence the people around you to uh, practice the dharma like you thank you thank you venerable another question from dukkha cause how to help teenage children reduce their mundane happiness in social media gadgets to pursue their real happiness or we just leave them to learn their way through their teenage years um i think it's a uh, common common problems uh, um during the pandemic because everything go online and uh, online uh, uh, lecture as well the classes everything go online but we can't stop them playing the computer games yeah or serving some others uh uh so called entertaining uh website yeah. how actually we cannot uh stop them not cannot be unable we unable to stop them i think yeah so what we could do um try to help them make a schedule in the day okay what you can do you okay, get what time you go for class and if you want to have your own leisure time get this leisure time um you can plan what you want to do yeah but you cannot okay uh violate this uh so called mutual agreement right so when you have this mutual agreement you discuss and plan out the schedule so uh, we must uh follow yeah strictly okay. both you see not only the children or the teenager but the parents as well you know we must uh follow strictly according to the schedule so this will build up a a discipline a daily routine yeah everyone could uh follow we must for and everyone must follow in this family okay and secondly how to uh, uh motivate you know, the teenager in term of the self discipline okay. um you can try you can try to share some uh, story you know, with with them okay a motivation one and also a uh, religious one or or whatever okay. try to uh, distract Yeah, or pull him out from the addiction. Uh, I can, I, I can. I, I'm, I'm not sure if is it correct or not. Addicted, the uh, yeah, most, most, mostly addicted to the game. So okay, do do something. Yeah, uh, pull him out from this circle of uh, enjoyment in the games. Yeah. or the drama so this is the way that we can do in the daily life but not forcing them while well, you must repent uh, uh in front of the buddha or you must chant 100 times first uh, before you can play the 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 computer games or punish them uh, by copying the sutra or etc this is not the right way so first of all we need to uh, discuss have a mutual agreement to 
uh, have a schedule, a daily routine, and then everyone in the family follow the schedule strictly. After that, you, know, you try to um, bring some uh, new, uh, new stories and also new activities you know, which related to the Buddhism and which related to some or even healthy sport. You can distract you know, their attention you know, from this edited uh, habit. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable. A uh, question from Brother Bakstan. What are your thoughts? Can Malaysia become like Bhutan? Um, sorry, I can't <laughs> Brother, Brother Pakistan, the question. Can Malaysia become like Bhutan? Otherwise, how many countries in the world can become like Bhutan? <laughs> Sorry, I can't answer this question. Well, it's beyond my authority or scope or my knowledge. Yeah, can Malaysia become Bhutan? But I can be sure. Yeah, everyone, you can create. We can create our own pure land, and we have. We can have our Bhutan. We can start from ourselves. Yeah and start from our family and then you can expand to the community the change begins with me first yeah all right thank you okay okay thank you venerable that's the last question for today so uh venerable would like to share merits oh yes all right okay let's uh transfer the merit uh, okay, everyone, please join palms. Yeah, you can practice this uh, every day before you go on the bed. May kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity pervade all worlds. May we cherish and build affinities to benefit all beings. May chant pure land and precepts inspire equality and patience. May our humility and gratitude give rise to great vows. Last but not least, thank you for joining us today's session. And uh, may Buddha bless all of you healthy and happy always. Omitopo. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable, for the most uh, inspiring sharing.